a bride to be vanished three weeks before her big day. I'm not going to assume that she had cold feet. I'm tired of hearing people say that. Nikki McCown was nowhere to be found, and Richmond police turned to her fiancé for answers. A lot of people were skeptical of Bobby. He was just very, very anxious, wanting to stay very, very calm, which was upsetting me because none of us was calm. Other suspects emerged as troubling stories from the past came into focus. He bought her some lingerie, and we were, like, freaking out over it. What did Nikki say about that when she opened it? She seemed embarrassed. Five months after Nikki went missing, a revelation that changed everything. Police found a key piece to the puzzle that would break this case wide open. I'm Elise Coulter. I'm Nathan Edwards. And I'm Becky Golden. This is Missing Nikki McCown. Starting an informal interview with Robert Webster. The time is... uh, 8.48 8.48 a.m. and the date, 7.25-2001. Three days had passed and 28-year-old Nikki McCown was still missing. She'd gone to her favorite laundromat and never returned home. The car she was driving was also gone and no one knew where she was. When police needed answers, they naturally turned to the most logical person, Nikki's fiancé, Bobby Webster. Detective Mike Wright said previous investigators hope to uncover any information that could help. It's real early on in the investigation. It's not going to be an accusatory interview. I think they're just trying to get as much information as they can and obviously still account for Bobby's whereabouts and what he may have been doing around the time that she went missing. The couple was set to get married in three weeks, and Bobby told police they were busy with the final stages of planning their wedding. Bobby believed he had a rock-solid alibi, but Detective Wright wasn't completely sold. When they're done at the mall, he goes home, he's making some phone calls, um, ends up watching a little bit of a movie, continues making phone calls, and then he ends up down at uh, one of Nikki's sister's houses. So there's a couple hours there that I don't know that we can account for. In the interview, police pressed Bobby for answers and began to dig deeper into their relationship. You said she was under a lot of stress over this thing, the wedding. I'm not going to assume that she had cold feet. I'm tired of hearing people say that. I'm not saying that's not what I was even going to indicate. I keep hearing cold feet. Maybe it's another guy. I've heard every possible slap in the face just from friends or people. Bobby kept talking in circles. Police had few leads and needed something to work with. Any thoughts where she could be at all? Nothing at all. I mean, give me a... I don't want to sit and go, maybe another guy. I do hope it's another guy. I can deal with that pain. Mm-hmm. Pain that I can't deal with is not knowing. I don't know if she's hungry. I don't know if she's Is yeah, she's what? This city's a word just can't eat. I don't know this. And I'm sitting around trying. Yeah, I'm just hoping it's another me. guy. I can deal with that pain. Bobby's interview left police with more questions than answers. A lot of people were skeptical of Bobby and some of the behaviors he was he was taking. Just didn't seem quite right with a lot of people. Did he take a polygraph test? He did. And did he pass? He did not. So you have not rolled him out? Me personally, I haven't. The failed polygraph was just one strike against Bobby. Detectives said there was more bizarre behavior just days after Nikki's disappearance. Actions that seemed odd for a grieving groom-to-be. Canceling wedding venues to returning a ring to cashing a tax check. Um, There were several things that, in the early stages, is going to grab anyone's attention and go, why is this going on? Despite not knowing where his fiancée was, he canceled the wedding venue, returned his wedding ring, and cashed a tax check, all while everyone else assumed Nikki was coming home. And Nikki's sister, Michelle, said that's not all. We did our first search with the Richmond Police Department. Remember that Bobby didn't participate in that search. My father even tried and he could barely breathe and he was still trying, but I I know everybody was upset that Bobby didn't participate. For many in the family, this behavior was suspicious. But Tammy was willing to give him the benefit of the doubt. I probably was the only one that believed that he didn't do anything at first because he was staying at my house and I was trying to keep him there. So if he did do something, I could see it. However, he was just very, very anxious, wanting to stay very, very calm, which was upsetting me because none of us was calm. When Nikki's sisters thought back to Bobby's behavior, they remembered another detail 
It may seem small to some, but to them, it was unsettling. It goes back to when they decided to file a missing persons report, and Bobby didn't want to. However, in the interview with police, Bobby explained why he felt it was too soon to call police the night Nikki didn't come home. I didn't say she's missing or anything like that. I'm just like looking for her. I didn't want to overspeculate mm-hmm. and feel stupid later on. Police didn't push him on his explanation, but her family did and took the lead on filing the missing persons report. And even as Bobby and Nikki's family tried to fill it out, Michelle remembers yet another part of the story it still bothers her and her sisters to this day. He'd rather watch a movie than report Nikki missing. He put in another movie that him and Nikki, I guess, have watched before she came up missing. That movie was called The Gift. It had a star-studded cast featuring Katie Holmes, Keanu Reeves, and Kate Blanchett. The plot, a woman about to get married goes missing. Police find her body in a pond. As it would turn out, the fictional fiancé in this movie had murdered his bride-to-be. Nikki's family found it odd that this was Bobby's go-to movie when they were frantically searching for his real-life fiancé. Bobby was the first suspect Richmond police talked to. Police just wanted any information they could get and hoped it would provide a lead. Police still thought it was possible that Nikki ran away. Detectives shifted their strategy and hoped someone else might have the answer they searched for. When we do our job, we check out everything. You know, we run dead ends all the time, but at least we're going to check those out. All right? So if there's names, that's what I want. Is there another male's name that you have in the back of your mind? Tommy Swint. Tommy Swint and Nikki had known each other at work. They were co-workers at the prison and friends outside of work. But her sister said their relationship at times was complicated. And while police still considered Bobby a suspect, they began to turn their attention to Tommy. Was it clear to you that he was infatuated with Nikki? Absolutely. When she first started working at the prison, she did go out. I would consider it a date. He took her shopping. I do remember that. But other than that, I don't remember them ever her looking at him as a boyfriend or anything like that. In fact, there's very little evidence a romance ever existed between the two. They saw each other work every day, but according to family members, Nikki considered him just a friend. Nikki's niece, Tamisha, was also her roommate in Dayton. She told us Tommy was always around. I thought that he was like her big brother, like he just looked out for her. And that's what I seen, but I think that's what I was supposed to see. Tommy was a towering figure. He was a tall, bald man with facial hair and glasses. He had this Southern charm and was always surrounding himself with women. But it seemed like everyone knew a different version of Tommy and at times even showed a dark side. Michelle witnessed it firsthand. One time I remember going to her house. I just walked in because I heard the screaming. And when I get inside, she, she had this love seat chair. And she's leaning back on it with her foot in his chest. And he's leaned over like this. And she said, get him off of me. He's trying to rape me. Michelle didn't hesitate and says she went after Tommy to save her sister. When she confronted him, he acted like nothing happened. And kind of just laughed it off and walked out the door. And I remember asking her about that. And she was like, I don't know. He was just playing. Just playing? Her sister didn't buy it. To most, that's when the friendship would end. The warning signs started piling up. For Nikki's bridal shower, Tommy sent her a gift that her family felt was inappropriate. He snuck it into the party by another female co-worker. He bought her some lingerie, and we was like freaking out over it, yeah. And we was like, what the heck is that about? Nikki, according to her family, was appalled. And she's she just like, I can't stand him. And she just threw it back in the bag and left it alone. But yeah, he did send her some lingerie. That's creepy. That's so creepy. Well, he was like, what the hell, you know? That unsettling moment lingered over the rest of the party. Michelle fumbled with her words and looked down at the microphone as she described the feeling in the room, almost embarrassed to talk about it still. I thought that they had stopped talk, communicating. 
What did Nikki say about that when she opened it? She seemed embarrassed. Yeah, I bet. <laughs> what did you think as her sister? I was like, I was just shocked. The lingerie story even made its way to family members who weren't at the shower. Nikki's niece, Tamisha, was pregnant and couldn't be there. Oh, I heard about that. What would you think of that? I thought that was inappropriate. Why would a man buy that? And it's like you were insinuating. I feel like that was leading up to what happened. Because it's like, you're doing that why? Just to see if somebody's going to get upset or see if you can get some action out of Bobby. In retrospect, it seems like escalating behavior. Yeah. Yeah, I do. I think that. He would always do things to let you know that he was around. Even like with my sister, even with anybody else, like he would let you, it was like he was a stalker type, like he loomed. And he would come back around and come back around and come back around. Nikki's sister Michelle and her niece Tamisha firmly believed he was responsible for other acts of intimidation, but they've never been able to prove it. Her tires were slashed in the process of all this leading up. This is before she left Dayton and moved to Indiana. And that's one of the reasons why they moved to Indiana. I feel like he was possibly the one that came down here and was like, you're not giving me that attention, I'll take that attention. Why did Nikki keep hanging around him? I mean, I was one that benefited from Tommy as well. Like any time that he would come around, we could go shopping. Any time that he was there, he would take us out to dinner. You know, it was just like, it was, oh, he's like, in my opinion, I thought that he was like her big brother. Like he just looked out for her. And that's what I seen. But I think that's what I was supposed to see. Even when Bobby was around, he would still cater to us. Did that bother Bobby at all? As like time went on, you could tell that it did because it was like more arguments and stuff. And there was several times that I would have to take them to work or myself and my son would spend the night there we would end up hearing things that we weren't supposed to hear or picking her up and taking her away from the situation because they're arguing or whatever. She would hang out with him or whatever, but she would never hang out with him by himself. Tamisha wasn't the only one who kept Nikki's secrets from Bobby. Nikki would get gifts. She would bring them to my house, leave it in my car. She would take it to Tammy's house, just anyone's house. So Bobby wouldn't know. And then when she got paid, she would act like she bought them herself. What Bobby didn't know didn't hurt him, or so they thought. But these secrets not only reveal the complexity of Nikki and Bobby's relationship, it also complicated the investigation into her disappearance, turning the case cold for months. Months have now passed since Nikki first went missing on July 22nd. It's now fall. The leaves have changed colors, turning red, orange, and yellow, and steadily fell to the ground. The weather is much cooler now, much like the investigation and any trace of Nikki. We've basically come to a stalemate when it comes down to uh, going any further with it. Uh, We would like to have something else to work with when it comes down to solving this case, but it looks like we're either going to have to rely on the public or some other information in order to do that. There's no playbook for families when a loved one goes missing. Talking to the police is obvious, but how do you get the word out? At first, Nikki's family struggled with this, but they remembered news coverage of missing nine-year-old Erica Baker out of Kettering, and a relentless father pushed Erica's case into the national spotlight. You may remember Greg Baker from our Missing Erica Baker podcast. He says Nikki's family came to him for help. We ended up going into Richmond and helped them. We actually uh, headed some of the searches for them. We were kind of like helping the family out and trying to keep them um, calm and and focused on what they needed to do instead of just being all over the place. If it wasn't for Erica Baker's family, I don't think that my family would have known the steps to do because you don't go to school learning about a missing person. And I remember them telling me, don't let them forget And that was Michelle's mission. They took the advice Greg gave them and started reaching out to TV stations and newspapers in Dayton. I remember the news coming out, who's going to be doing the talking, nobody wanted to speak. I said, fine, I'll do it. Somebody has to say something. And so Michelle did. It was her first time on camera. She was nervous and her voice shaky. She looked just like Nikki. They had similar hairstyles and were only 18 months apart in age. She pleaded for help, hoping, praying, begging for information. 
Well, we, Nikki's family, are speaking out to you, the public, asking for help in any way. It just seemed like from there on, it was just constant us passing out flyers. We was traveling. It was a mess for the first couple of months. A mess. As the family continued to search for Nikki, they were desperate for answers, and police had very little evidence. Behind the scenes, investigators continued to hit dead ends left and right. The family kept spreading the word and hoped their message would make its way to Nikki or someone who knew where she was. Nikki, if you were out there and you hear me, I love you and I will not (laughs) stop looking for you. It was at this time that nine-year-old Peyton started to realize her mom was in danger. Do you remember the moment when the reality set in Mm -hmm. and the first time that you felt scared as a kid? I went back to school. I started third grade. She wasn't there for the first day of school. And that was one of those things where, you know, like school shopping and things like that. She was a very active mom. So it was scary. I don't know where my mom is. I don't know what's happening. Peyton, now back in Richmond, living full time with her grandparents, tried to adjust to life without her mother. It was a a huge adjustment because I was with her all the time. I went from being with her 24-7 to having to live with my grandparents. They were older and they had already raised eight kids of their own. The family started to grow impatient with the lack of answers from police, so they conducted their own searches. They knocked on doors, checked local parks, and tracked down any nugget of information they could. They took shifts on, you're going to stay with the kids, or we're going to do this with the kids while you guys go out and follow this lead or whatever, but it was chaotic. But all that changed four months in. Finally, Richmond police got a major break in the case. The vehicle was found parked at the Meadow of Catalpa Apartments in Dayton. The car Nikki was driving had been found, but it wasn't where anyone thought it would be. It was discovered nearly an hour away in Dayton and across state lines. It was the first new development since Nikki was seen on the Village Pantry surveillance video, the day she went missing. A huge development, especially since police had very little evidence until this point and had initially thought she just ran away. Finally, a sliver of hope for Nikki's father. It's a start. It's more we've ever had. It's what we've been waiting on. But where was Nikki? And how long had her car been there? This new evidence led to more questions than answers and a plot twist her family and police never saw coming. Authorities are not sure why the vehicle was at the apartment complex, but family members say it's the same community where McCowan's ex-boyfriend still lives. We're not looking at a random person anymore. When the car was found, I said, now this is a freaking setup. Next time on Missing, Nikki McCown. Immediately following her disappearance from this laundromat, it was thought that Nikki McCown was abducted from here. But months later, police found her car in Dayton with her clothes neatly folded in the back seat. That got police thinking she could not have been abducted because there was no sign of a struggle. Probably be in a field or maybe even in a pond or a lake, uh, but to be found in an apartment complex. I think you either look at either someone who's staying there or someone who wants you to think someone who's staying there is involved. What do you make of that situation, the state that had been found in, ransacked, a window busted out? What do you think of that? I think that happened after the fact. I thought it was drove there and it was like set up for that to look like that. That's all for this episode of Missing Nikki McCown, a podcast from Dayton 24-7 Now. Find us in your podcast app and follow the podcast on Apple Podcasts and Spotify or wherever you listen to your podcast so you never miss an episode. If you really like the show, leave us a rating or review. It really helps new listeners find the show. Missing Nikki McCown has been a production of Dayton 24-7 Now, an affiliate of Sinclair Broadcast Group. Lee Furry is our producer and Brian Petrus is our associate producer. Editing and audio engineering by Eric Newell, with additional editing by Adam Bronstein. Mitch Hansen is our senior podcast producer. Jordan Rizzieri, a producer. Production coordination by Anna Nicole Washes. And legal support from Chase Bales. Rich Cook is the head of audio at Sinclair. This is still an active investigation. If you have any tips about the case, please contact Richmond Police at 765-983-7247. For more reporting from Dayton, head to Dayton247now.com. We've created a special section dedicated to this podcast. 
Until next time, I'm Nathan Edwards. I'm Elise Coulter. And I'm Becky Golden. This has been Missing Nikki McCown.